So uh, that is my very great pleasure to introduce um, Professor Marjorie Senechal. So um, uh, Marjorie is the uh, uh, Professor Emerita of Mathematics and the History of Science at uh, Smith College in the United States. Um, she, uh, she actually she said to me she wasn't sure why she'd been invited. Uh, there's <laughs> extremely <laughs> very good reason for this. Um, which actually my, my master's student, Naomi, who's uh, here today, uh, she's started learning about quasicrystals, and uh, she'd been studying, uh, you know, she said, well, how do I learn about quasicrystals? And I said, well, the best textbook to, to pick up is Marjorie Senechal's book. Uh, and then she, I said, oh, come to Hatfest. And she said, oh, my God, Senechal's going to be there. <laughs> <laughs> so I think many of us learned about uh, the tilings and quasicrystals and these things from, from Marjorie's book. She's also uh, very knowledgeable about the history of the, the subject, um, She's written various very interesting articles on, on um, different aspects of it. Uh, there's a particularly moving in fact, I think the only sort of uh, uh, thing I've read about the history of uh, an aperiodic tiling that was genuinely very moving was the, the history of uh, um, Robert Hammond's uh, work, um, which so it's well worth checking out that article if you can find it. Um, so with that, I'll uh, introduce the stage to Professor Marjorie Senechal. Okay. Thank you, Felix, and thank you all for being here. And whatever reason I was invited for, I'm delighted that I'm here. <laughs> it's a great honor. I mean, I don't know of any, uh, anything, any event in mathematics that's had the instantaneous worldwide renown as this one, just nonstop from the moment that it was first posted. This is just, of course, being in the internet age, we can do it, but nevertheless, it's, there's so many reasons why this is so interesting to so many people. And uh, what I'm, I'm going to, my talk's going to be very, very general, and I'm hoping more to generate discussion, not only for the question period, but for the day, days and, uh, and then to answer any questions. I don't think I can answer anything. But the last question we were discussing with Dr. Penrose's talk was really connected to the relation between the, the hand and the mind, and I think we could say a lot more about that, or we can see a lot more about that as we go along, and uh, let's just think of this as a time to formulate questions. And um, so let me start. And the title is Hiding in Plain Sight. I should say, once, once the, the hat hit the headlines, uh, reporters started calling. They were calling me, too, for some odd reason. And the questions that I got asked over and over again uh, by, the, by so many reporters, one was, uh, why was it hiding in plain sight? I mean, why did it take so long to discover this? That was the other. Uh, was it, were you surprised that it was not, not a professional mathematician who found it? And, my answer was, I would be very more surprised if it were. <laughs> <laughs> and things like that. So let's take those up as we come along. Not by point, you know, just in general. I have those things in back of your mind. Um, let's see. So there it is, sitting right among the hexagons. Oh, I see it didn't show up in the hexagons. It was supposed to show up there, and something went wrong. That it show up, said, I don't know why it didn't. Uh, Anyway, but it, you can, you, we'll come back to it and see it again. So um, just a simple polygon. And why hadn't anyone noticed it before? And maybe because uh, paradigms, they were baked into tiling theory. And I'm using baked as sort of a joke because tiles were baked in the ovens. Uh, <laughs> but baked into tiling theory and crystallography, which really is a very important generator of, of, of ideas for this and uh, examples and questions. Uh, in tiling theory and crystallography, over the centuries, were pointing in other directions. And the, we took those pointers and followed those directions, and that didn't take us here. When I, let me be clear that when we, I say we, I'm not talking about me and, and a couple of people. I'm talking about the whole general community. And certainly I'm not talking about when I say, why didn't we notice it, the people who did notice it, because there were people who were right here with us who did. So think of we as sort of the general we, not the royal we, and not the, uh, but the general we. Um, and I'd like to dedicate this talk to the memory of Uwe Grimm. Uh, this is the Grimm Network uh, talk, but uh, my friend and fellow A period edition. And that's a picture of Uwe here at a different symposium uh, five years ago. That was the last time I saw him, sadly. But anyway, this is for Uwe. Um, and we, I want to follow two intertwining streams. One is 
uh, ornamental patterns, and I'm not going to distinguish tiling early on, tilings from ornamental patterns. I could, they're, they're, think of them as the same tilings or a form of ornamental patterns. And uh, crystal geometry. And by crystal geometry, I mean not only the crystal shape, but also the internal structure of its, of its atomic patterns. This is this particular, uh, this is the oldest piece of ornamental art, if you want to call it art, uh, that I've been able to find a picture of, not find it itself. Uh, 70,000 years old from a cave in South Africa. And you can see the, the lines incised on it in an ornamental way. I mean, it's meant to be a pattern. It's not, it's not a picture of anything. Uh, it's not a, um, a message to anybody, as far as we know. It's just pretty, in the, or it's an ornament with a crossing lines. So, and the display at the Mining, Mining Institute in St. Petersburg, Russia, uh, this is um, a mock-up of a mining shaft and a mining, uh, whatever they call the little, little hut on top of it, and some of the crystals found in, in the Ural Mountains there. Okay. So, uh, so ornamental patterns you find in all cultures and in all ages, and this one is well, 1100 BC, uh, tombs of the, the, the pharaohs, walls and ceilings covered uh, with ornamental patterns. Then we have the Alhambra Palace in Granada, Spain. Some of you have been there. Uh, there's not, I don't think, I was there, I think I'm correct, not one square inch is left untiled in the whole thing. It's just one magnificent uh, spectacle of tilings. And then there is, uh, just outside the door here, this wonderful, uh, unique Penrose tiling of, of the pat patio. And that's the period here we're talking about 2,000, 3,000 3, years of ornamental art, but the spirit is the same because it's beautiful and we want to convey that through the decorative arts. Um, and uh, there was, I'm going to focus a little bit on a wonderful book called The Grammar of Ornament, uh, written by Owen Jones, who was a curator of the, maybe it was the first World's Fair, the great exhibition at the Crystal Palace in London in 1851. And he was obsessed with ornament, and he sent his, his artists and his students out all over the world to copy ornament wherever they found it. And then they created a book, uh, which you can see online, uh, if you can't find the original, uh, called The Grammar of Ornament. And by that, he's really talking about grammar. He thinks there is a grammar of it, and that is what he is writing about. And there are 100 colored plates, um, which were all done on stone. And I think they left the stones in when they put the book together. It's the heaviest book I've ever tried to <laughs> lift in my life. But anyway, 100 colored plates, and that was 1868. And uh, he shows that ornamental patterns have been created by all cultures in all eras. And here are two pages. One is the first one on the, this one. I won't try to say what's left and right. This one here is Byzantine. That's what, I mean, this, he labeled them by what he, where he thought they came from, and they came, where they came from, where they copied them from. This is one of the Byzantine pages. This one's one from Chinese ornament. And one of the statements that he puts in the book is, see how various the forms and how unvarying the principles. And his question is, what are the principles and what can we learn from them? Uh, and if you look at these, you see several things. One is that they are all familiar in a sense. We've seen all these things before somewhere. Uh, and they are really, uh, there is something common about all of these. You see hexagons, you see squares, you see uh, <coughs> diamond shapes. And uh, you also see that these are all periodic patterns in the sense that this, you could imagine, uh, although he doesn't say anything about tiling the entire floor or wall or ceiling or infinite universe, you could take any one of these and continue it. And how would you continue it? You would take this block and put it next to another one, just like it next to that, another just like it next to that. And you would continue it throughout the plane. If you are of an age that remembers wallpaper, then <laughs> you wanted to get wallpaper, you went to a wallpaper store and they handed you a book like this of pages. And you then flipped through it and figured the one you wanted. Now you were only seeing a small square piece, but you knew exactly what would happen. It would be repeated continuously and periodically. Uh, edge to edge across the, 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 uh, the surface that you're, that you're decorating. So this is one of the principles, too, of the grammar of ornament, is that these are periodic. Nobody was thinking about, there were some things that were circular, you know, spherical or circular around columns and things, but nobody was thinking about, is there any periodic tile? That was just not 
the question there at all. Um, and uh, the, one thing that's very curious, if you look through this, it's a fascinating book. You look through it, you look through, for example, Egyptian ceiling patterns, which is what you see here. Um, many of those look like woven patterns. And the conjecture is, and this is from Elizabeth Barber, who's an archaeologist in, uh, uh, of uh, prehistoric textiles, that they were meant to be looking like woven patterns. Because these were for the tomb ceilings. And the tombs were the home for the people being buried there for the rest of their eternity. And it should look like home. And so the, re the roof should, the ceilings should look like the ceilings and they're supposed to in the walls. And they often used in Egyptian homes, they used mats, woven mats, for the ceilings. This hot weather, they didn't have to worry about, uh, about cold or so. So they could do that. And they put mats often laid on poles across the rafters in the houses. And so if you looked up in your own house, you would see a pattern like that. Another common source of mats overhead was the outdoor pavilion erected to, uh, to provide shade from the hot tropical sun. And another was used on barges uh, to keep you from the sun. If you were going down the Nile in a barge and you look up, there's a rafter and it's a woven mat. So woven mats were on the ceiling all, all the time there. And it made sense, uh, that's according to Elizabeth Barber here, that it made great sense that that would be what they would, uh, that they would, uh, that they would paint on the ceilings and paint on the, uh, the walls. And so that's one source of just common everyday usage of where ornamental patterns may come from. And you see when you're doing weaving and then you're building in repetition, there's this, this nothing surprising that you're not looking for a periodicity because weaving is periodic. It's up and down and up and down, under and over, and so on. Um, there's, there are other theories of where ornamental art came from. My favorite is from the Professor Heinrich Kluger, who claimed that they were hallucinations seen by people <laughs> on mescaline. And uh, he himself studied this very carefully by taking the drug himself <laughs> <laughs> over and over again. And he, in the order, and after you know, how many little drips or drives or whatever it was, he recorded what he saw. And always he saw first, first he saw gratings, lattices, fretworks, filigrees, honeycombs, and chessboards. Yeah. Then with the next dose, he would see cobwebs, <laughs> then tunnels, funnels, alley, cone, or vessel, and then spirals at the end. And he is quoted today. I mean, this book is 1926 or something like that. It's quoted today as being, this is what is found, and it actually seems to be what people see. But what was really interesting to me is that these are, these are every, most, uh, he's talking about ornaments, that they are combinations of these things, and that the hallucinations do appear as projections on wall and ceilings. If you're high on this drug, you'll see something on the ceiling, just like this. And his point was that this may be where ornamental art comes from. And there are serious studies of the origins of ornamental art in the caves uh, th that back this up to some extent. So anyway, that's another theory. We won't go any further into it, but I just thought you should know uh, that some, of them, some mathematics may come from places like that. Um, this is from Grammar of Ornament, who listed four very important his principles. Uh, best ornamental styles accord with form and nature. We won't deal with that right now, but however varied ornament may seem, it follows but a very few simple laws. And then we'll look at the other two uh, as we come along. Now, what are the laws? The laws, are, it's interesting, uh, how many of you knew, how many of you played with kaleidoscopes in your lifetime? How many of you knew that Brewster, who invented the kaleidoscope, did not mean them to be a toy? <laughs> He, was, he didn't mind that. I mean, he, he was a very particular guy. And he didn't mind it, that children used them because they were learning something. But he designed this thing as a precision tool for artists. His idea for the kaleidoscope was to teach artists how to make ornamental patterns. And they had to do that with, through geometric ornamental patterns. So to learn the geometry of the angles between the mirrors and learn how many, what you'll see when you look through the kaleidoscope. And he invented just about every variant on the kaleidoscope, including the ones that cover the entire plane and so forth at the time. He, and he wrote a little book about it, History, Theory, and Construction of the Kaleidoscope, as a tool for artists. And uh, it has turned out to be also for mathematicians in a certain sense. One thing he didn't like was people using the word kaleidoscopic, because that would sound sloppy. And then so sort of, you know, he, this is a precision tool. This is not sort of kaleidoscope. So anyway, that was Brewster. Uh, and then we have this, uh, John Herschel was a uh, famous astronomer, and he was one of the inventors of photography. The terms negative and positive views there came from him. 
And uh, he would have upset Brewster very much if he's, but he suggests uh, that there's a kaleidoscopic power of, in the sensorium, that seems to be our brains, uh, to form regular patterns by the symmetrical <laughs> combinations of casual uh, elements. And uh, he's sort of saying that we make this up. In other words, there's something inherent in us to, to make ornaments out of things that we see and out of little pieces that, that are lying around us. For true or false, I don't know, but anyway, that, that is what he suggested there. And there are still people, scientists working today on the relation between the visual cortex and the visual hallucinations. Just to, this is still now it's still a subject of scientific study. Um, the more, more important to our needs right now, the tiled floor in Glen Lair, which is the home of the physicist James Maxwell, uh, has this very nice tiling um, here, uh, which he designed. And the history the, that you can read about it, Glen Lair online uh, explains that this was inspired by the grammar of ornament and the kaleidoscope. So I guess that just like Sir Roger, Sir, uh, Sir James was playing with and having a very interesting time with patterns and changing, moving things around and experimenting. And this is what he then designed for his floor. Um, this is the 1868 version of the Penrose courtyard outside. Um, but in math, this was tying into mathematical currents at the same time. Uh, so very, the very same time as the grammar of ornament and the kaleidoscope, we have Felix Klein, who was extremely influential in mathematics, uh, with his what called the Erlangen program, uh, subsumed geometry to group theory. And I won't go into all of what he did, but he felt that, I'll, I'll just one, this, one little quote over here. He wrote in a book called The Icosahedron, which is one of the five regular solids and one of the, with the dodecahedra and, and the, and the uh, cube and the tetrahedron and the <coughs> octahedron. Um, he wrote in, in here, uh, the figures are for us only the framework by means of which we survey the totality of certain rotations or other transformations. Now, what's important about the icosahedron is its rotations, the fivefold rotation, threefold, twofold, the mirror planes that run through it, um, they're in, the way those interact with each other and the fact that you get an icosahedron out of it is irrelevant. I mean, there's not, you, no, no, no models here. The, in the entire, in this book, in this version of it that I have and the original that I've seen, not a single picture. It's hard to imagine a book on the icosahedron without any pictures, but this one's on the cover, but that's the only place. Because the real thing here is the group, the asymmetry group and the group theory. Now, my point is that that's where we're pointing to and that's where we're being trained we're not looking outside that framework enough, possibly, for, by today's standards. <clears throat> so this is Klein's program, basically, from math to math. You start with any pattern you want to here. Um, you look for its symmetries here, <coughs> mirror planes, rotation center. Um, you get rid of all that you don't need there, because all what you really need there is those symmetry lines and one little tri triangle, because this will reflect into hint. This will reflect to this, and then this square will reflect to that, and then that reflects to this and reflect that. You get the whole thing with this much, if you know the rotation, where the, where the mirror lines are in the rotations. And so, really, you don't need this anyway. That's only if you want that mat. But if you understand the essence of a mat, of a square mat, this is what you're looking for. And this, you don't need any of the, of the rest of it. So it's the program for Klein was going from here to here. And whereas we're trying to maybe today to talk about going that way and with diversions and discourses. Uh, yeah? Just, we can't see what you're pointing at. Oh, this is supposed to be pointing. I think you have to point it at the actual screen. Oh, OK. Well, anyway, thank you for telling me. I didn't realize that. Um, well, you can see, I don't think I need to point <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> It'd be hard for me to not fall down, but you can see where, it, where it's going. Um, and uh, I'll, try, I'll try to point up there, but maybe I just won't point. Um, okay. So this is a very well-known article um, <clears throat> by George Polya, mathematician, in 1924, in which he enumerated and he illustrated the 17 uh, plain tiling groups uh, well, the 17 plain tiling groups. And you can see these are the illustrations. Um, 
and the symbols that he has attached to them are his way of representing the symmetries that they have because that's what's important to him. The drawings there are just so you can see sort of, you know, get a better visual sense of how the symmetries work. Uh, what I want you to notice in here is the title. And the title is On the Analogy of the Crystal Symmetry in the Plane. So he's saying that this is an analogy of what's, in, what's been studied for crystallography. This is 17 plane tiling groups. How many are there in three dimensions? Some people know. 230. They were all found before these 17, which is amazing, isn't it? I mean, because the impetus there was to understand the crystals and the crystal structure and understand the crystal symmetry. And so that was done by studying the symmetry groups. And they were counting up 230 of them. And then Polya and, uh, asked, well, what about the two dimensions? That's a lot less. Uh, and he did this. And this became a very, very popular um, paper. And it's cited and used in many different ways. Actually. He had been anticipated by the Russian mineralogist Fedorov, who we'll talk about in a little while, but nobody knew that because Fedorov had put it in a book that nobody could read. And so that, it's only later that it was found. Uh, what was Polya doing here? I just want to point out that his, what he calls C3, so if I can point <laughs> up there, uh, what he called C3 uh, was, um, was made of the, of the kites. And it's very, to me, striking, very strikingly similar to the hat. Well, it's not the hat. It's got fewer kites, but it's the same spirit. And you think, what if he had been playing with these things? You know, he might have come across the other. And who knows what would have happened. But he wasn't playing with these things because his job was, or as he saw it, was just to look at the symmetry groups and not to ask any <laughs> questions about things outside them. So there he has this, which is such a similarity to me, and then takes, what, almost 100 years to find the hat. Uh, so in a way, it's been hiding in plain sight. And yet, in another way, it would take a very different kind of vision to see it in those days than it does now. Um, so just to mention Polya's influence, it was huge. And he, was, he inspired Escher. And this is a drawing from Doris Schatzneider's paper on the Polya-Escher connection. Uh, with uh, some of the uh, of Escher's notebooks, starting with what uh, the the little tiling in the middle, which Polya had called D1 uh, GG, and then show how Escher saw it and transformed it into the birds. And I think most of Escher's drawings of periodic patterns. He has many many other kinds of drawings, but his periodic drawings were, are like this, in that they start with one of uh, one of Polya's drawings and then just Escherize it, as Roger Penrose was saying. <laughs> Uh, except that he was the Escher. Um, um, now we're going to change gears a little bit and talk about the <coughs> um, the uh, mineralogy and the crystallographic uh, thread of this story. And so this is a picture, a very famous picture from the School of Athens by Raphael. It's in Vatican City. Um, if um, on the left there, you see Plato coming through this, talking to Aristotle as they're coming through. And so the gateway there. And uh, the question is, what are they doing and why are, what are they talking about? Um, one thing is we see that Plato is carrying a book. And if you look closely at the book, I mean, it's actually in the painting. I'm not making this up. Uh, you see the title of the book. And the book is the Timaeus. And that is famous for... Um, its discussion of the elements of the world. So this is early physics. All the world is made of four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. And um, that's what they're made of. It's actually a very, I, won't, I don't want to take much time on this, but it's actually worth reading very interesting because he was trying to explain phase transitions into why, between liquid and, and uh, solids and gases and so forth and using this that way. And it's, very, it's a very clever and interesting if flawed uh, theory of, of the makeup of the Earth. Uh, so anyway, Plato and Aristotle are talking. And as they come through, Plato is saying, and I'm, now I'm paraphrasing. This is not the, the ancient Greek. But, and the shapes of the particles of these elements, earth, air, fire, and water, are the cube, the octahedron, the tetrahedron, and the icosahedron, respectively. And this on the right is Kepler's drawing from the harmony of the world of exactly the, the octahedron here you can see representing air, 
cube is the earth, the tetrahedron was fire, <coughs> icosahedron was water, and dodecahedron was the universe. And so, uh, that, uh, uh, anyway, um, so they're discussing this. This is what Plato argues. And these are the particles of the elements. Uh, he doesn't say atoms because they didn't use the word, but the particles. And Aristotle says, no, those can't be the shapes of the particles because not all of them fill the space. So his, his idea was that if you're going to have particles, they must fit together and make the thing that they're making. So air particles had to fit together and make air, but octahedron don't do that. They don't fit together and so forth. So he's saying that can't be the shape of the particles. Only the cube and the tetrahedron fit together. And as we all know, tetrahedron doesn't either. <laughs> <laughs> just the cube. Uh, uh, if you go out, just as you leave here, look at the sculpture in, outside. Uh, and then there's another bigger one, a wooden one in the lobby upstairs. And it's of 20 tetrahedra put together or under vertex. And you can see they don't fit together. Uh, and then read the wall text for this. And I, if anyone can explain this to me, not this minute, but tomorrow, talk to the artist. The artist can explain it. He says, logically, they should fit together to form a whole, but they don't mm -hmm. for various reasons and dynamics and so on. Why logically? <laughs> I, I don't understand it. I mean, the reason they don't fit together is that they don't. <laughs> 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 and th that, was a p that was a problem for philosophers for a long, long time because Aristotle uh, 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 was supposed to be right about everything. And so if Aristotle said that the tetrahedra fill space, fit together at least and fill a, sp a space around a point, then they do. And if our math isn't telling us that, that means our math is wrong. And it really took uh, until the Middle Ages and the development of spherical geometry before they could actually prove that he had made a mistake there. And uh, the reper repercussions continue today. People are still writing papers, very interesting ones, on, well, if regular tetrahedra don't fill space, which ones do? Because some do, with slightly different angles or slightly different lengths, edge lengths. And another question is, well, if they don't fill space, how tight can, they, can you pack them? And though these questions are live research questions. And here's a uh, <coughs> quote from the New York Times, just uh, 2010, packing tetrahedrons and closing in on a perfect fit. They're not going to get a perfect fit but they're closing in on. And they're trying, so there was a lot of competition to see what percent of, de of space could be packed with regular tetrahedra. And at this time, this article was written, 85.63% was, was the, t the uh, greatest. Anyway, leaving the tetrahedra and go on. Uh, looking at, there was a, a scientist, even early as Kepler, and we're looking to see, again, explaining various forms by few principles. This, uh, uh, this uh, statement by Owen Jones explains a lot of mathematics, a lot of science. We're looking this whole world with all its complexity, what are the basic principles there? And Kepler made this very historic uh, conjecture that are explaining the hexagonal flakes of snowflake, uh, six, hexagonal forms of snowflakes. And he used spherical particles to do it. So this is a very famous uh, book of his, or it's actually, it was a letter to a friend, a New Year's gift, explaining that. I put it here partly because I wanted to say this, and also because I want you to know it's here in Oxford, the copy of it. And this page that you see here is from the, the library here at St. Edmund Hall. And I don't know if you can get in there to see it, but if you can, it would be really worth looking at and see the real thing. Um, <clears throat> and Robert Hooke, about the same time, was using... Uh, very few principles to explain great variety of form. And he was looking at the forms and shapes of crystals. And uh, he, he, you can see from his drawing here, these are some of the shapes that he was looking at. He was looking at these under a microscope. And uh, then he was trying to model them by sphere packings. And he, here it looks like circle packings. And, uh, you know, quite reasonably so, I think. He did, it was pretty, pretty uh, uh, convincing. And he wrote in this wonderful statement, had I time and opportunity, I could make probable that all these regular figures that are so conspicuously various and curious and do so adorn and beautify such multitudes of bodies rise only from three or four several positions or postures of globular particles. There aren't very many different kinds of sphere packings. And yet with those and finishing off the stacks in different ways, you get these different forms, but they're all really basically the same. And those are the most plain, obvious, and necessary conjunctures that are possible. Uh, <clears throat> But uh, by 1801, the sphere packing was not being used so much to explain the crystal form as were tiling hood blocks. And it's sort of black to Plato with, with his, the earth and the, and the cube. Uh, these are some drawings by Aoiya. There's supposed to be a, a umlaut over the U, but I can't get
get my computer to put it there. So we have to just forgive me for that. And uh, anyway, this is one of his many drawings where he's showing how to make a certain uh, form, crystal form, out of stacking blocks. And he has one you see there, uh, I'll try to point. Uh, the one on the left is a rhombic, will be a rhombic dodecahedron when it's finished. This will be uh, a pentagonal dodecahedron, but not a regular one. That's the pentagons will, are not regular pentagons, but there are 12 pentagons and so on. Um, um, so his model explained a lot of uh, some, some things. Uh, he, he, what, his forms didn't come out exactly right the way they were supposed to and so on, but people by and large accepted this. Uh, this his way of building, building shapes or trying to imitate the crystal shapes with, with, the, <coughs> uh, with the blocks. But they were, the biggest issue then was what are these blocks supposed to be? What are they? We, there is no concept of atoms as we understand them now. And no, nothing that he could explain made sense. They're just sort of theoretical blocks there, but what they were physically, this is supposed to be a crystal after all, uh, what they're supposed to be. Um, this, this went on and on until one of his students said, uh, don't ask what the blocks are, ask where they are. Uh, in other words, more, more going like from math to math. Uh, don't ask what's inside here, ask where these blocks are. It's just really positions, their arrangements in space that matter, it doesn't matter what they are. And uh, he put them in the lattice form, which is, these are all translation, translation groups. And the, this was, problem was solved by Bravais in 1848, and these are still called the Bravais lattices. And there's something to learn from that. Uh, and this is one of the things that uh, Roger Penrose mentioned in the last talk. You can easily prove that the rotation, the possibilities of rotations of a lattice are very, very limited. <coughs> And in two and three dimensions, and when you go in higher dimensions, you have more possibilities. But two and three dimensions, um, you don't have much. Because in a, in a lattice, these lattices are a set of points. They're, they're arranged in rows and columns, and they're equidistant in each, in each of these directions. And there's a minimum distance. These are discrete points. So there's a minimum distance between the points. Now, and each point, let's say each point is a rotation center for the lattice that's going to be built. Now, I don't know if you can see up there, uh, I have made those five-fold rotation centers. And so one, the one point and the two, have two points at minimum distance from one another. That means in the entire lattice there can't be any two points closer than that. And now let's rotate uh, one, take the center on the left and rotate the other center around it and we get five points in a circle. And then do the same thing on the other side and we get five points on a circle. And then you see what happens is that up at the top there, you get two points that are closer together than that minimum distance. Does that, can you see that without my, without this? And, it, and so they're too close, so that can't, you can't have that rotation. Now if that, was, had, had, that had been a 90 degree rotation and not 72, then you would have built a square, and that's fine, the same distance above as below. If you had been a 60 degree rotation, you would get the two lines joining. And so that would be okay too, because the distance between these points would be zero. But anything other than 60, 90, 180, say, you can't do, third, uh, um, so 120. And that's why when you work it out, you can only get the twofold and threefold, sixfold, fourfold, uh, <coughs> where did four go? Yeah, four up there, uh, rotations in the lattice. And that's, that was called the, rest the crystallographic restriction in that it meant that crystals are restricted to these rotations because they, if, their lat if their body, if their atomic uh, pattern is a lattice, which people believed it was, then the only kind of rotations you could have are those that are possible for a lattice, and that's these. So that meant that you couldn't have any of the others. And uh, so um, that meant five, five fold was impossible. So it was seven, eight, nine, anything greater than seven, than six. Five and then six is okay, and that's it or impossible. So now here we have a picture of a pyrite crystal. And this is, a, it's modeled by the Aoi with his blocks. And if you look closely, it takes a little time to do it, but look closely at the pyrite crystal, you see those pentagons are not regular. Uh, and if you look at the model, they're not regular either. So I'm putting this there. And the upper about, uppermost edge on that is longer than the other four. So that, that matches. The pyrite crystal and the pyrite drawing match five, but what doesn't match is regular dodecahedron. 
because those, that's not regular. Those are not regular pentagons. So this is the so-called crystallographic restriction that was overthrown with the discovery of quasi-crystals, and thanks in part to Penrose Tiles too. So now, just mention Fedorov himself. He's another genius who was not a mathematician, and his mathematical writings are almost impossible to understand for anybody. Uh, uh, he, uh, but nevertheless, it's, it's very clear that historians have dug deeply into them, uh, that he did, in fact, do some of the things that he said he did, not everything. Uh, but one thing he did was he said, what shapes can these blocks be? They don't have to look like just square cubes. What could they be? And he found that there were five different possible shapes that fill space by translation. So you put them just one next to another. And he gets these <coughs> five. Um, and he was also known for many contributions to mineralogy and was a, a first elected rector of the Mining Institute. Mathemat mathematician he was not, but he did a lot, found a lot of very interesting mathematical things. Uh, so that was one thing he did. Also, he was looking at the tilings in the plane, as I mentioned, long before Paul you did it. And he modeled, as he modeled crystals, his model for crystals was that you have these parallelohedra, which are blocks next to each other. Each of those are broken up into subclusters, sub into sub -poly, sub, yeah, sub polyhedra. And those he, he thought could each contained a single molecule. So there were molecules sitting that could be grouped together into parallelohedra. And the plane, in a sort of analogous way, if you have parallelogons, the, square, the uh, squares or hexa hexagons, you can break those up into what he called planagons. And the reason I mention this is because it led him into a big mistake, which we'll come to, which is very relevant to what we're talking about. Uh, but meanwhile, he also enumerated the 230 groups of crystal structures. And he noticed that, uh, he, and this was one of his contributions to this, that mirror reflections had to be included. It's sort of like what we're still talking about, isn't it? Whether the, the hat, we should allow mirror reflections or not. Uh, and he was the first one in, in this, counting up the crystallographic groups to say we've got to let them in because that way we get the complete ensemble and we can really understand all the groups. So he insisted that. At Klein's suggestion, same field of Klein we mentioned before, who was not aware that Fedorov was doing this, urged the German mathematician Schoenflies uh, to do the, enumerate the groups. It, it didn't, I say enumerate the 230 groups. They didn't know it was 230. They were enumerating some, how many there were. And the two of them, to actually, Fedorov and, and Schoenflies worked together on the, toward the end, helping each other in getting, establishing the 230 and proving the role of, the, of lattices within, those, uh, within the groups. Uh, my, but I'm showing this because my favorite quote of all of all this whole thing is from Schoenflies, who says, Within the fundamental domain, the crystallographer can do as he likes. And if that isn't a bit of mathematical arrogance, I don't know what is. So all that really matters is the symmetry group here. And whatever it was in that block, we don't care what that was. And you know, he can do what he wants with it. Um, anyway, uh, then as following Owen Jones, the change comes suddenly throwing off some fixed travel. He's talking about ornamental art, but we're talking about tilings. Uh, in 1912, Max von Lauer, the physicist, discovered that crystals diffract X-rays. And two years later, uh, William Lawrence Bragg showed how to read the X-ray pattern backwards and deduce the crystal structure from it. So this becomes a two-way street, that the X-rays go are diffracted by the pat lattice pattern. And you get a photo something you can record on a photographic plate, and you can read that backwards and figure out what the structure was. And one of the first things they discovered is that there are no such things as crystal molecules, that these molecules that were supposed to be housed in their little boxes weren't necessarily there at all. Because, and sodium chloride, which is, all of you know, is the three-dimensional checkerboard uh, for halide, um, there, you can't group those into molecules. And so that, that was, ended that theory of crystal structure uh, and made the lattice model stronger than it had been even before, which was very strong. Uh, so another footnote. And this is one that pertains to the aperiodicity. Fedorov believed that he had proved that any monotiling of the plane uh, whatsoever, you could always group the tiles into, into, little, into sets, uh, congruent sets that were equivalent to these parallel legons. They may not look like exact squares, but they were fourfold in some sense, like um, putting that there. So you can see I've, these, this square has its vertices at the fourfold rotation centers of the pattern here. And this is basically, that is what you need. That's your, that's your mat that you can then copy uh, with a 
<coughs> by translation. Uh, he thought he had proved this. And we know he didn't prove it because we know it's not true. So that's, uh, but he, that was because his imagination, however great it was, did not extend to anything beyond the periodic. And all, all of his patterns, all of his groups, everything was where, that's where his mind was fixed. Um, so for him, that was that. Uh, and then Wang conjectured a more sophisticated version of it, which is that any set of tiles, that, set of shapes that tile the plane in any fashion can tile it periodically. Not that that particular fashion does, but that you could find another one. Whereas for Fedorov, any mono tiling, you could do it. And so this is my own, my, my own example um, of the, uh, the seven gone, and then this is from tilings and patterns, a picture of it as a spiral. That's certainly not a periodic tiling, but I, you can take that out and make a periodic tiling with it. That's, that was what Wang was saying you should be able to do with any tiling. If it's not periodic, you can make one with it. But we, as we know, Berger disproved Wang's conjecture with a set of 20,000 square periodic tiles, and Roger Penrose found his celebrated two by 1974, and this is uh, we've heard all, a wonderful lecture about all of this, the development of that. Um, and uh, he, he, he did, answered a lot of the questions I had had about the relation between Kepler's uh, drawings of the, period, of the uh, <coughs> tilings of the by polygons and his own work, and that was very interesting. We, so we saw this picture several times. Uh, I wonder if Kepler had pushed on with his AA tiling and tried to make more of it, would he have discovered uh, aperiodic tilings? But not. Uh, we'll just mention here that Alan Mackay startled the 1981 International Union of Crystallography uh, by with showing a diffraction pattern of an early Penrose tiling, in that early one of the earlier forms. I don't think this was the two, uh, but you see there that's the tenfold uh, impossible, uh, for, impossible for a lattice and impossible uh, symmetry, and. Uh, but Allen had did this. He did this diffraction pattern because he suspected that there was order here. The sharp, bright spots here reflect what they mean in a diffraction pattern is that there's order in that some sense, and that it's a long technical thing. But it means that there's a, some sort of order, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the lattice order. It could be some other order. And Alan Mackay had been arguing that for a long time and trying to urge crystallographers to go beyond their their rigid mindset um, and to generalize the whole subject of crystallography. And so he did this, he was delighted to find this because he wanted people to realize that order doesn't have to mean translation. There are other things too. Uh, <clears throat> and then as we know, this was found in nature and uh, crystallograph crystallographic restriction turned out not to be a law of nature as people thought it was. And uh, Dan Checkman got the Nobel Prize for this and what I think it's important to understand here is why, why they gave him the prize, um, not just for discovering this, but because pushing for understanding how it might work, and they, as they, they said in the Nobel, the Nobel Award, discoveries fundamentally altered how chemists conceive of solid matter. And it wasn't just chemists, it was everybody else too. And there here is a little picture of the first structure that was solved, uh, quasi-crystal structure, and it's, you see the dodecahedra and tricontahedra, and they're all overlapping and intersecting, and it's a very interesting structure and it is not just parallel lahedra stacked together. But the path from two to one was a two, two aperiodic tiles to one was a long steep trail and that's why we're here because we're finally at the end of that trail. Uh, and just a couple of quick reasons why that might be so and then come to an end. Uh, because maybe because we weren't sure what we were looking for. As you, you've seen already the, uh, these pictures, uh, the, the, the Smith Conway Danzer at the top and then the Taylor Sokolar in the middle, and then this one, of course, is our is the little uh, <coughs> specter. Uh, but at, the, at each stage, when the Smith Conway Dancer tile was presented, and this is a periodic tile, and it, it absolutely was. You could not make a periodic tiling out of it. But people were going around saying, "That's not what we were looking for." And you say, "Well, but you didn't say what you were looking for. If this isn't it, you know." So what we really was happening was a refinement of the question. So that this became, we built in that there should not be plain, periodic plain, planar uh, sections of this thing. Then come the sailor, Taylor and Sokolar, that's great, but it's not what we were looking for either. Well, what were we looking for? Well, they should all be one piece. You shouldn't have disconnected tiles. Okay, but you didn't say that. Well, now you say that. So then each, at each this is how math grows. I mean, this is, this is the way we all learn, is we think we've got it, and then we realize that isn't what we meant, and what did we mean? 
And now here we have this wonderful specter. Uh, Yoshi had drawn up uh, after the discovery of the hat. That's the cutest little thing in the world. Uh, and surely we weren't looking for that. And yet that's it. So there, this is very uh, uh, interesting question of how, what looking for. The, the relation between discovery and justification, a lot of other th philosophical issues come up here, but we'll keep going. Uh, I love the quote that Chaim uh, gave to uh, one of the science news reporters. He says, that before this work, if you'd asked what Einstein would look like, I would have drawn some crazy, squiggly, nasty thing. Uh, and yet it turned out to just this hat, which is a simple polygon. Uh, but we get the crazy, squiggly, nasty thing with the specter, so I think. He justified. <laughs> um, so another reason is that although impossible symmetry means it's not periodic, if you see a tenfold diffraction pattern, you know you don't have a periodic structure. It's not necessarily the vice versa. You could have a, a crystallographic seeming diffraction pattern, and yet it's not periodic. And that's what's happened here with the hat. Um, but the hat's time diffraction pattern looks like this. And this is a, from Joshua Sokolar's paper on this. Uh, that's perfectly acceptable in crystallography. But if you, find, if you found this experimentally, uh, would you startle anybody by it? Would you look at it twice? Would you say, oh, no, that can't be. This is impossible. Would you put two exclamation uh, points by, by in your notebook the way that Schechtman did? <laughs> no, you just go on. So you think this would go, but there, seemed to, there may have been in the sort of a subtle expectation that if it's going to be non-periodic, it's got to have the impossible symmetry, not but that it was both ways, even though we know that logic, that's not true. That's a possibility. Also, we were using what we knew, we in the general sense, instead of just messing around. And it's just messing around is how it was found, according to David Smith, and we'll get to mess around this afternoon in the workshop. Uh, and it's now then, another question that, that science reporters were asking everybody was, uh, uh, the uh, let's see what what one to have one to put that. No, I don't I forgot what I was going to say. But anyway, uh, they had the since since the discovery. Oh, I know what it was. So the question they were always asking was, but this hasn't been peer reviewed, and I answered them, no paper has ever been more peer reviewed than this paper. This, everybody all over the world is reading this paper and combing through it. If there was a mistake, we would have found it. We, quote, would have found it. Uh, and among the things that were found in this really massive peer review uh, is that the, the Hat family, and it's a big family, infinite family, fits into the, some of the structures that were already created for Penrose topics and other things, like the cut and project method and the hierarchical structure that we've heard about already today and things like that. But that's not how it was found. And there is always a discussion difference between how you come across something, a discovery, and then how you show that it's true. And that's the justification. The problem is when the justification becomes the, the method and then the, the discovery gets lost. Uh, so we're working in this balance area here, and that's what it's about. Uh, and then uh, grammar of ornament ends with future progress will blend, blend tradition with a fresh look at nature. And I'd say that uh, well, there's already future progress here. Uh, <coughs> the uh, the uh, hat tally paper introduced a new proof uh, that is very unusual. I've never seen anything like it. Some that are, are resemble other proofs, and then this other one that does not. And this is a wonderful picture from Craig's animation that you have to go online to see. Uh, and also tomorrow we'll learn about other new directions that people are taking. This is uh, <coughs> just my screenshot of the program for tomorrow. And then we can always just go take a fresh look at nature. And this is a uh, woodshed by some friends of mine in, in New York. Uh, they call it the Topless Tetrahedral Observatory. And so I just thought I would show it to you as a good place to go sit and think about new directions. And that's it. Thank you. Time for questions, yeah. Uh, yeah, so we have a time for a few questions. Uh, anyone has any? Perhaps I'll start things off. Uh, okay. <laughs> you gave lots of examples of uh, these, these things that we've, we've patterns we've seen and, and, and know about, and then actually they've been discovered in a different context before. Yeah. Uh, sometimes in nature and, and sometimes you know, in, in weaving, these kinds of things. Do you think we'll uh, discover that some, the hat was actually discovered before and we just didn't know about it and didn't spot it hiding in plain sight? You know, my, my immediate gut reaction when this 
first was publicized, the, the hat, was that it's going to be found, and it's going to be found in, I was basing my thinking on the second proof that was given there, which was looking at the whole as the lattices, the way that lattices can interact with each other. And there's a whole area of material science of epitaxial growth and so forth, of surface, one surface growing on another, and I thought, there's going to be something here. Hmm. But I don't know if that's true. That just was my gut reaction, but I do expect a yes. Okay. Yeah. That's great, thank you. Uh, yes, there's a question back from uh, Stefan. Uh, just a few more. Can the Gould covering all the can be seen as an early attempt from uh, I can't hear you. Uh, um, the Gummelt covering, can this also be seen as a milestone on the way to the, to the model trial? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. do, so you know the, the Gummelt covering of the, the Penrose tiling, I suppose? Uh, so no, I don't think I do. Which, which is that? Uh, shingle. Oh, shingle. Yeah. Shingle. No, I don't know that, actually. Uh, the thing I'm thinking, I, I think the question was maybe that uh, Gummelt showed that, you, um, I think Conway proposed it originally. Oh, Gummelt. Yeah, oh, her, yes, her, her yeah. stuff. Yeah. Do I, it went, so what is the connection with hers? Hers was a, using, hers was using uh, 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 coverings as, uh, rather than tilings, yeah. Right, because they're allowed to overlap. Slightly, right, right, they're allowed to overlap. But what no. was the question? I think the question was, do you, uh, do you see that as a sort of milestone along the way to finding the monotile? Um, I didn't at the time, uh, because there were lots of different versions of overlaps and so on. And then I, did, I thought it was very nice, but I didn't feel that it had uh, it was going to point in new directions particularly. Okay. And then it was superseded quickly, you know, by all the, pen, the Penrose tiles too. So, right. but it, maybe there's still things there to look at. Again, maybe this is time to relook at that. Uh, there's a question from Michael at the back, maybe. He's, he's running around with the microphone, don't worry. Oh, okay. <laughs> there he is. There you are. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe a little comment to this boy from Petra Bummel. That was specifically done on the recommendation of Christoph Band, who was thinking out of the box, that was a ah. natural topic, to try to find a way to construct a Penrose tiling with one tile. And, oh, uh, and it was okay. kind of clear to them that they wouldn't succeed uh, with a monotile approach, so they allowed overlaps. And in that sense, I would actually say, yes, that should be considered as one step in this, okay, thank in this you. journey, because it was the explicit goal of Christoph Bond to, to find yeah. such a thing. Well, I thank you very much, and I, must, I may have known that at one time and totally forgotten it, but you're absolutely right. That would be a very important step. But anyway, that's, let's add that in a further history. That's not what we wanted. That's right. <laughs> okay, there's a question from Just actually, I'd like to... Can you even bother, because it's really for Craig. So, <laughs> so there was another near miss that you found... Somebody had discovered the hat earlier, right? Yeah, I, 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 I to touch on that. I think you can actually, it's like a close, close call. Yeah, there, there's nothing new about the shape no, or yeah. about polychytes more generally. Mm -hmm. Those go back a lot. You just you needed the right confluence of right. someone looking at all the shapes systematically and interested specifically in their tiling theoretic properties. Yep. yep, yep. I, I threw a slide in with, with a picture. Oh, good, good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, maybe should we have Lorenzo and then Dan? Just a comment on oh, uh, I mean, the, 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 the notion that, that the, the, hat is, the hat is made out of a, of a polycup, but of course there is this whole continuum of hats. Yeah. And, you know, the, you know I think that the, the, the fact that it was looked for in a polycup is a reflection of the, okay, we're building on previous modes yeah, of thinking. Yeah, yeah. Because combinatorially, you, know, you don't need the polycite. No. And you can do everything without, without any right. sort of underlying lattice structure. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's and, very and good. It works yeah. just great. Yeah. Thank you. Do, do you want to pass the microphone over to Dan? Uh, is there anyone? Thanks. Uh, thanks for the great talk. I was just wondering um, 
if you had to bet, do you think more volatiles are going to be found now? Um, yeah. Yes. If they are. Are they going to be found by professional mathematicians? Or <laughs> 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 I think everybody here will walk out with a bond of their own. I think you know, there'll be lots more fun. I think it's a whole world waiting to be found. And relations among them. And that I was very excited about the second proof in your paper. That uh, I thought that was fantastic. And I think that will change the way we look. That's a whole new opening in this, in this theory. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I think perhaps we'll wrap things up there. So let's uh, thank uh, Professor Sonny Charles. Thank you. Thank you very much.